Um, so I'm going to talk to you about Elbrus first. It's the highest mountain in uh, continental Europe. It's on the border between Russia and Georgia here in the Caucasus um, that run between the Black and the Caspian Sea. It's about a thousand kilometers long this range. And we fly basically all of our trips. Um, we include international flights from Ireland. Okay. So with um, for Russia, we fly um, with Aeroflot uh, via Moscow and then down to Mineral Nivodny, which is the um, airport closest to Elbrus. Um, we do that kind of on a, we leave Dublin fairly late in the first day and we get in there the next morning. On the way back, we have an overnight in Moscow. So you guys get to go out and check out the Red Square and different things there. So um, yeah, so basically it takes the guts of two days to get down there. From uh, the um, airport, it's about an hour drive to Patagorsk where uh, it's kind of the nearest town to, to the mountain. And um, you can do, there's some things to do there after the mountain, but before we go up there, if you need to rent equipment, you can do that there. So we have a night in a hotel and then the following day um, we drive out to Emmanuel Meadows, which is our base camp, or sorry, the, the starting point of our trek up Elbrus. Okay, um, this, is, this is the shot here. So it's really basic. Um, it's just, we just drive in here, four hours, kind of 100 kilometers, pretty bad road. And then we start climbing up the mountain from here. Um, and the first day takes us up to um, day four, basically the first day of trekking takes us up to camp one which is basically just on the edge of the, the snow line up here out of shot, okay? Um, so the big question, guys, who here is signed up for Elbrus or are thinking about doing Elbrus? One, two, awesome, okay, cool. So, uh, yeah, brilliant, uh, super, super. So this, the, the thing with Elbrus is, um, there's, uh, most companies go up from the south side, okay, maybe 90, 95%, and we, um, climb the mountain from the north side okay neither route is overly technical you're on snow and ice but it's they're still kind of considered trekking peaks because it's, it's not there's no vertical sheets of ice it's just walking in the snow and ice the thing the difference um between them is is significant though because on the south side this is the the opposite side that we climb the mountain um you do acclimatization um up and down the mountain but in effect you start at uh, you drive into 2200 meters then you take a cable car and then a chairlift and then a piece machine up to 4,700 meters and then you walk the last 900 to the top, okay? You do that over several days, but effectively on the, on the summit day, you motor to 900 meters to the top and then you walk from there, okay? So that's the way most people do it. And um, couple, I think the year before last or a little bit, anyway, two or three years ago, we stopped doing it from the south side because it just didn't feel right. What happened was one of our teams, in bad weather, they actually motored all the way to 5,100 meters to the saddle, which is um, in between the two mountains. And uh, they just did uh, 500 meters to the top. So I decided we were gonna change that. So the north side um, is really remote and it's not technically any harder, um, but the highest point that you can camp is at 3,700 meters. So that means you have to go uh, 1,900 meters uh, vertical gain on the summit day, which is really, really long, okay? It's, uh, if to put that in context, on Kilimanjaro, we do 1,200 meters. On Aconcagua, we do 900. So 1,900 is, it's a lot, okay? Um, but it can be done and it's the right way to do it. So, you know, I'll, I'll talk you through it. So anyway, guys, there's the, the base camp, Emmanuel Meadows, we drive into there. And then the next day, what we do is, um, we load uh, half of our gear into, into our bags and we walk up to camp one, okay? And then we drop half of our gear there and we walk back down again, okay? This whole section is a, is a trek. Um, it's really, really straightforward. Stunningly beautiful, the Caucasus, if you get them on uh, clear weather, they're absolutely stunning. If you get them on bad weather, it's a different story. Um, but beautiful, beautiful mountains. And this is just a, a really, you're kind of acting like a porter here, um, obviously with a smile on your face and loving it, but that's effectively the name of the game today. Um, and then that evening, once you drop your stuff, we have a bit of rest there. We walk back down to Manual Meadows the same day. And then day five, we move up to camp one. Okay. Um, and this is um, camp one. Okay. So you can see here, guys, they've got these little barrel huts. So normally we um, get those for, um, you're, you're spending most of your time in those. That's where you're based um, for the rest of the trip. You're, you're sleeping there. And it's great not to be camping, but these things get really, really hot during the day, okay? It's not cold, but it gets, once the sun hits them, it's super, super hot. Um, yeah, 
and then the next day then day six what we do is we get you guys really really comfortable um putting on taking on and off your crampons and moving in crampons on different levels of ground it's really um we can prov we provide all the training on on the expedition for you guys to move and so nice if you get the opportunity to do more like go to scotland for a weekend definitely a good idea but it's not essential okay the main thing you need for Elbrus is to be really tough and stubborn and, and like hardship that's that's really important so we take you guys um up um yeah just around the camp but generally we're kind of like just getting you skilled up and then resting and acclimatizing to that height okay the next day then um is probably one of the harder days uh yeah the hardest day except for, apart from the summit day we uh do an acclimatization hike on the same route we go to for summit but we walk up to um 4700 meters to lennox rocks and um this is just getting you guys acclimatized to higher elevation getting you settled in getting you moving on the snow and um yeah just really acclimatization we then um come back down and rest on day eight and then day nine is your summit day which is 16 to 20 hours okay and then day 10 we have um a spare a spare day if we need it for weather or further acclimatization these day eight nine and ten will adjust that on the expedition depending on weather okay so for example if we see on day nine and ten there's really bad weather coming in we'll attempt someone on day eight okay we we'll just dictate that that's really dependent on the weather forecast and how it's looking um okay so i'm gonna the basically the north side guys the real thing is the elevation gain the amount of time you're walking um it's it's very very tough um you basically um get back up to lennox rocks and then you have a long long traverse to get over in, into the saddle between the eastern and western summits the elbrus i think i'll give you a shot of that guys hang on yeah you can see it here guys the two summits this is the eastern western summit there's only 40 meters between the two okay but and the western summit is the highest point in europe it's one of the seven summits so that is the goal we're going for um so yeah it's going to be you're starting basically if you haven't been on a big mountain like this before you'll be starting um, probably just after midnight depending on the weather and you'll walk most of the, the get the, the the back broken of the summit attempt in the dark which is great because you can't see how far you've got to go um and then as you start moving higher up the sun will start coming up um and you'll eventually after a long time hit the saddle okay um which is the just in between the two summits and then from there you just follow up um up to the western summit itself it's a fairly straightforward route um and it's just one of our teams on the summit so yeah i think with elbrus guys the main things i would say to you is um the weather you can't control that but it is a significant factor there um so for example this year we had two teams on on elbrus um on one team nobody went to the top because of the weather and the other one um nine out of 11 people no sorry seven from 11 went to the top okay which should be kind of above average but the conditions on Elbrus and Aconcagua, for that matter, comparatively, let's say to something like Kilimanjaro, which you can tackle in any kind of conditions, really, uh, Elbrus and Aconcagua, they're very much, if the weather is bad, it's not a case of, okay, we're really tough, we can go anyway. It's, if it's bad, it's bad, you can't, you can't attempt it, okay? Um, that's Elbrus, all right? So from here, guys, you, uh, we, um, we head back down to, from uh, base camp, we drive back to Manuel Meadows. We then drive out to Patagorsk. We have a night there. Then a night in Moscow. There's a full, I think we've like 30 hours in Moscow if you want to do some sightseeing there. And then we fly back to Dublin from there. Okay. Um, so that's Elbrus. Um, Aconcagua um, is a stunning trip. It's absolutely awesome as well. Um, it's obviously the, another one of the seven summits on the border between Chile and Argentina. Um, it's a brilliant trip, 22 days. Um, I can't say enough good things about this. The real advantage of um, Aconcagua over Elbrus, well, as you know, it's quite subjective, but food would be a big factor, okay? In Russia, you're gonna get plenty of food, but it's all pretty bland, okay? You'll be well fed, but it's not gonna, but in, in Argentina, it's completely different. Uh, if you get off the mountain a few days early, you get to spend time in Mendoza, which is absolutely awesome. But anyway, I'll talk about the mountain a bit more. Uh, so we again we include international flights typically we fly with um, Lufthansa to Frankfurt and then into Buenos Aires directly from there because it's kind of annoying you go backwards to then go go across the Atlantic and then from Buenos Aires we just take a short flight up into Mendoza itself 
it's a big city again you've got time to rent equipment if you need it and then from there we drive out to uh penitentes about four hours on the highway this is a uh, a ski town guys but obviously we um go to Aconcagua in the middle of our winter which is their summer so there's no skiing there at that time um, and there we basically pack and arrange our gear for the mountain so Aconcagua you kind of break down into sections um, the first section is basically getting from the trailhead to the to the base camp of the mountain okay um, and Aconcagua itself is uh, quite interesting again um, this is the summit here guys this image isn't very clear apologies for that but this is the normal route in here guys okay um, which is again 80 90 percent of climbers go in this direction um, and it's just a two um, you, you basically walk into confluence and then from there you, you go into plaza de mules which is at 4300 meters we go in this way in the vacas valley which is a th three night trek um, so two night three days um, so it means that you're walking into a base camp over a longer period of time and which is better for acclimatization it's less busy it's more beautiful it's just the, the best way to go in so that's the first um three days of the trek and um, so um on this section we put the bulk of our gear in duffels and you just carry um what you need each day and um, so you're walking in pretty light so the main um issue people have on this section which is really really important to bear in mind um is that it's ridiculously hot it can be upwards of like close to 40 degrees and um where we run see people running into difficulty is if they get sunburned and when you get to a higher elevation that doesn't really heal and it can bother you quite a lot um, and also it's quite dusty so it can affect your respiratory system which is going to um, inhibit you from breathing properly higher up as well so looking after yourself on these three days is really really important um yeah it's a really beautiful walk in this is the vacas river um and this is basically um this is actually really funny you actually walk upstream here guys from from the the left of shot and as you're coming around people they're always looking at this peak here going oh my god there's Aconcagua it's huge and then they come around a little bit further and they actually see the summit and it's it's really nice uh experience to see that and you're still like 12 days off of it you know it's kind of cool um so we cross this uh Vacus river behind us and we head up that valley to base camp um it's a beautiful walk in really really nice kind of nothing crazy like you know i think this day is eight hours the other two are a little shorter um yeah and you're just enjoying it taking it easy not worrying too much about someone at this time just look after yourself really well and then this is plaza argentina so it's a big fixed base camp um on the on on, on the edge of the glacier there on the moraine so here we have um we sleep in these big uh, dome tents they're really strong fixed tents so you can walk around in there it's really comfortable you get fed really well um they actually um they serve you a, a glass of wine after each meal here it's really really plush you know especially after you've been to elbrus like it's a bit it's it's really nice you do the other way around it's a bit of a shock to the system um but anyway guys so the next section right is um getting us from base camp up to camp one you break that into that section so what we do is when we get to plaza argentina we take a rest day then we carry our gear, some of our gear up to camp one, um, come back down the same day, take another rest day, and on the fourth day we move up to camp one properly, okay? So, um, and this is inside the tent, and just chilling out, playing games, resting up, um, just making sure your gear is all sorted. And what we do here is you're basically, the mules have dumped off your duffel bag, and, um, you're then transferring all the gear out of that into what you need to take up on the upper mountain. So um, you're gonna be carrying everything that you need on your back, plus some of the share of the um, the communal gear, like stoves and food, you're expected to carry some of that as well, okay? You can hire porters on Aconcagua, it's possible if you don't wanna carry all, all your own equipment. Um, it's just very, very expensive, but it can be done, no problem. We can organize that really easy. So the key thing is that you don't carry too much up there. I'll talk to you, I'll get into you and rant at your property of gear in a minute. Um, but um, basically what I'm doing here, guys, is kind of calculating, uh, this is, we're looking at how many days we're gonna be on the mountain, how many hours we think we're gonna be walking for, and bringing the correct amount of snacks for that. Because the thing about it is, is um, every gram counts, okay? So when you're looking at stuff like two Mars bars weighs twice as one. Uh, that's the way you got to look at it rather than they're both small and they weigh hardly anything i'll throw them both in the bag 
every gram counts. So you need to make your bag as light as possible and conserve your energy. So we do that and you guys are packing and unpacking and then you get going. So we then, this is the base camp here. We walk all the way up to camp one. This is actually um, quite a tough day. There's some loose scree, um, but nothing like the, nothing uh, out of the ordinary, very, very manageable. Um, and this is uh, camp one, okay? So again, there's no mess tent, no uh, portable Wi-Fi, no drop toilets, nothing like that. It's pretty basic, um, and this is this is where we we move up in day ten. Um, from here, guys, the wet the again, like on I was mentioning on Elbrus, from that point on, the itinerary is a little bit flexible with the weather, you know. Um, but you know what we have on paper and what we try and do anyway is um, day eleven we carry around the mountain um, to um, camp two, which is five and a half thousand meters. Sorry, something I, I forgot to mention, guys, is when we come in the Vacus Valley, we um, actually descend down on the normal route. So we, we actually climb the mountain, ascend from one side and go down the other, so you get to see both, which is really awesome. So anyway, day 11, we um, carry up to camp two, um, drop some gear there and come back to camp one and we have a rest. Um, and then the following day, we move to camp two, okay? Which is really stunning. You you start moving around the mountain. You get all these amazing views. It's absolutely awesome. Um, and then from there we um, let me just have a little look here. Yeah, cool. So this is the move day. So you can see you're kind of traversing around the mountain. You can see the trail here, guys. It's really really beautiful. Um, again, you can see um, this tracker here. She uh, it basically it's actually quite hot when the sun is on you there, but it's just completely covering yourself from the sun. It's really really important. Um, and the dust as well. And then on, yeah, so you move up to camp two. And then from camp two, um, because you're at five and a half thousand meters, your body's not really resting at that height. So once we get there, we move directly to camp three, which is about three to four hours. Um, it's really, really slow pace there. You're carrying, you're carrying a good bit of weight. Um, and you get up to camp, camp three at 6,000 meters. So just over the top of Kili, and we, we make a camp there. And the next day we go for a summit. Okay, so what you do is on Aconcagua is you don't move up to Camp Three until you're kind of feeling like the day after you can go to the summit. Okay, you don't hang out up there. It's it's really hard to to rest and for your body to recover. It's too high. Um, yeah. So these are some of the views from Camp Three back down the normal route. Um, so summit day in Aconcagua. Um, one of our guys just wrote a, an article about which one is harder, Elbrus or Acon Aconcagua. Um, very, very subjective. It kind of depends on the person and the weather on each day. But again, you're looking at a kind of a 15, um, a 12 to 15 hour day. Um, and what you kind of start off again in the dark, you these kind of fairly gentle um, switchbacks up first kind of three hours, getting you up to about 6,400 meters where Independencia Hut is. And then from there, um, you start this thing called the Traverse. You basically come over a shoulder and you're straight into the prevailing wind um, for about two and a half to three hours to the base of the Canaletta. If anyone has done any research in uh, Aconcagua, the Canaletta is this kind of gully, but it's it's really straightforward. It's just kind of built up a lot online. Um, and then from there, the base of that, you we take this rest in this place called the cave. It's sheltered from the wind. And then from the Canaletta up to the top um, is about two to three hours, going very, very slow. And then from there, depending on the weather, you've a bit of time at the top, about four hours back down to high camp again. So just to show you guys, I don't know if you can you can pick this up. It's hard. It's different when you're looking at an image and you've been there. Um, so high camp is is below this little shoulder here. Okay, it's six thousand meters, and in the independent the Independencia hut is just out of shot here, and this is the traverse, guys, all the way along here. There's this little kind of stick of rock here halfway across that gives you a little protection from the wind that you can stand in behind, but it's that bit's really, really tough. And then this is the scree, this is the canalette of the gully that you come up here. And then from there, then you walk along the, this just below this this uh, quite steep ridge here, or cliff, I should say, and then that brings you right up until summit, okay? And again, with Aconcagua, you generally have it in pretty good weather or it's shocking weather and you can't, can't get up there at all, okay? Um, so from then, um, we have two rest days built into the itinerary after summit day, so 16 and 17. We wouldn't really spend them at 
uh, high camp as I mentioned. So we'll either use them up getting up there or if we go to Itinerary's plant we'll descend down a bit quicker into Mendoza and you guys can have more uh, time to eat steak and drink Malbec and, and, and do all that kind of thing. So from Camp 3 to Plaza de Mules it's about six hours downhill and then day 19 is Plaza de Mules out to Penitentes. I don't know if I have a shot of, yeah, so that you basically do that whole normal route in one day. It's about 27 kilometers and it's like a serious kick in the ass because you're not expecting it. Um, but it's a long, long march and uh, it's, it's a real killer on the feet. And then you get out to Penitentes, you have a night in a hotel and you have a wash and you wash away like 15, 16 days of dirt. And then we go back down to Men Mendoza. And yeah, you can, when you're there, you can go on a wine tour, which is absolutely amazing um and yeah so that's basically Aconcagua then we fly Mendoza back to Buenos Aires and from there to Frankfurt and Frankfurt to Dublin so guys just something to be really clear on with you guys neither of these trips are class classes climbing peaks they're really trekking peaks okay so it's not technical mountaineering okay as I said it's it would definitely be useful if you want to do some winter mountaineering but you don't need to um if you can put one foot in front of the other and uh, you can follow instruction you're not going to have a problem okay um so what i would say to you guys is um on um on elbrus uh the day you carry from uh, uh base camp to camp one you got to take about 15 to 20 kg in your back okay and also with such a huge although you're not carrying any weight the summit day is really really hard on Aconcagua, you're going to be carrying 20 kilos every day on the upper mountain, okay? So it just goes without saying that you should be able to breeze that at sea level, all right? So as a good guide of fitness level, you guys should be comfortable walking in the Wicklow or Irish Hills really slowly with 20 kg on your back for 8 to 10 hours, two days in a row. Then your fitness is, is, is A1, okay? With that, guys, if you're going out training with, with weight on, like that kind of weight, you need to really adjust um, to walking a lot slower, okay? Because it, you burn a lot more energy with carrying that weight. So it's very important that you don't go out and, you know, maybe you normally do the spink in two hours, two and a half hours. You put 20 kg on, you try and do it in two and a half hours and you're absolutely wrecked after it. And you're going, gee, I'm not fit for this. That's not a good way of going about it. You need to allow yourself more time and you need to eat lots and lots of food. Eat lots and lots of food if you're carrying a heavy bag. It's really important. Um, so, you know, I don't know where individually you're all at with your fitness, but that's what you kind of need to be aiming for for, for these trips. Um, any type of cardiovascular training um, or strength training will really help you out for this. But what I would say to you, um, in preparation in general, um, I think sometimes people get unlucky with um, acclimatization, but in most cases, uh, in my experience, it's people not being prepared properly or not looking after themselves properly on the mountain that results in them not getting to the top. Okay, so yeah, weather you can't really control. Acclimatization, you can do a lot about it, but sometimes you just get hit by the altitude and those things, but prepare yourself properly is really, really key. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a fitness. You can, kind of, I can answer questions on that at the end. Um, for We do um, pre-departure weekends before all of our events. So you'll come out and meet one of our experienced um, expedition leaders and a doctor and um, we get a full brief on the trek and then they'll also um, give you feedback on your fitness it's not a fitness test but we'll do a long hikes on these and you'll see where you're at really and give you advice on your equipment and answer any questions and you get to know the people in the group i can kind of go especially is like 22 days long um it's a really good time to kind of pick a pick a 10 partner if you can or you know, request not to, to to if you meet some of the training weekend, they're wrecking your head. You're like, geez, I don't want to be 20, 16 days in a tent with them. So you can email Joyce and ask her to sort you out with somebody else. And all of our trips, guys, including these two, are based on um, twin sharing. So we'll put you in a tent um, with one other person, or you'll be in a room twin sharing. Or if you're signing up as a couple or mates, you can you can share. There's no problem. Um, yeah, these are really essential. For Aconcagua, um, we, so Aconcagua we run every January, so the training weekend is usually in November, but we also do an extra day in, in June or July just to see where everyone is at with that. So it, it's, it's three days of training with that trip. Um, yeah, so um, I, I say this at all the talks, but it's true. Like I think the great thing about these trips is just getting out into the wilderness and meeting uh, like-minded people. Um, 
and there if you if you love uh, pushing yourself and hardship these trips are awesome you're gonna you're gonna love it um yeah